The tale of human conception is perhaps one of the better known biological processes. With two key characters, the sperm and the egg. We always knew that the story of the sperm reaching the egg and fertilising the egg was, was inherently dramatic, so we had a chance to shoot a film of it, effectively, to make a drama out of this journey. By having a chance to use graphics of this calibre, um, we were able to take a tiny little cameraman, if you will, and, and stick him in the landscape of the human body to see the journey of the sperm like, like wildebeest coming over the hill. But it's the final moments of the fertilisation process and the response of the egg which really intrigued the team. Scanning electron microscope images were useful in getting an initial picture of what the sperm look like as they try to get into the egg. But reference material became less recognisable as the team pursued how the egg responds once fertilised. The human body is a pretty difficult area to, to make new and different because there isn't a huge amount of reference at microscopic level. And shortly after sperm egg membrane fusion, there are changes inside the egg which stimulate what you see as explosions. And what that does is it stops other sperm getting through. And as a consequence, only one sperm fertilizes the egg. This crucial event gave the team the option for a dramatic final sequence. The moment when the sperm enters the egg and sets off this incredible sequence of explosions, that was a real challenge for the graphics team. What they had to do was input the physics of these little tiny explosions into the computer. They left it running overnight, and what came out at the end is what you see. It's amazing. It's quite nice in the way they've represented the explosions, uh, represent uh, exocytosis, as we'd call it. It's quite nice to show that, because it is an important event, uh, the very early events of fertilisation. People who watch it think, oh, how did they do that? And that was our ultimate goal. If we can achieve that, then we're, we're happy. In this programme, we also featured the formation of the human face. This posed a much more difficult problem because it wasn't an obvious journey. The face is a really important part of who we are, so that was something we really wanted to focus on. Initially, our searchers found some academic diagrams and images of embryos at around four weeks. This is where facial development begins. But they were one-off images we would need more to create a 3D animation. What we did was approach universities and ask them whether they had any scans of those first early stages of the embryo. The universities of Edinburgh and Newcastle were able to provide us with a series of images. I was given 3D scans of human embryos, which I took and stuck together to create a very basic animation of how the face forms. But it still wasn't enough detail. To really capture this process, we needed to understand where the different parts of the face begin developing from. It's bizarre that the face is constructed by two plates moving in from the sides and one moving in from the front. It doesn't really seem to make any sense until you think we came from animals like fish whose noses are at the front of their heads and their eyes are at the side. As we develop, our eyes begin life at the side of our head, our ears in the neck, and our nostrils at the top of the head. And this was the final piece of science, which gave the animators the missing elements they needed to create this never-seen-before animation of human face development.
pacemaker cells control the beat of the human heart. I think these are my favourite cells in the body because they start beating three weeks after conception in the womb. So what we wanted to do was recreate that magic moment when they begin to beat. The pacemaker cells are some of the only cells in the body that stay with you throughout your life. They are never replaced. But to get these pacemaker cells into the show and to talk about when they begin to beat, we had to create a three-week-old embryo. But a three-week-old embryo measures just four millimetres, the size of a pinhead. There were some limited images available of an embryo at this stage, but it posed a real challenge for the team. I obtained many images of the early human embryo and discovered that it has almost no features that would make it recognisably human. The only real guide the animators had was a replica of an embryo aged about three and a half weeks. What's really interesting about this model is that even though it's a slightly later stage, um, we can see some of the interesting things that we, we need to get onto our three-week-old fetus. So you can kind of see parts of the spinal cord developing here and parts of the skin zipping up around the edges there. And also you can kind of see the layout of the brain. It really gives us a good idea of, of a starting point. So we've used this quite extensively in um, making our models. But producing a realistic animation of the three-week-old embryo was harder than they had imagined. The team worked their way through many manifestations. First of all, we called it the parrot on the string, and then the graphics team went and tried again, and then it looked like some kind of mummy in space. And it took us probably four or five weeks before we had a version that we were happy with. In fact, in the end, the animators produced around eight different models. It's a case of finding a, a nice aesthetic medium, so you really find something that's appealing as an image and that draws you in and makes you want to kind of learn about the processes that are going on that we're trying to describe. We were really thrilled when we finally got it right. The three-week-old embryo looked weird and wonderful. And it's amazing when you think that we all looked like that at some stage in our life. The programme also featured the animated story of our red blood cells. It differed radically from the creation of the embryo animation, as there was a clear journey to follow and a far greater availability of scientific data. Some of which came as quite a surprise. The team found images showing the red blood cells being fed, nurtured and then released into the bloodstream by white blood cells called nurse cells. The storyboard artist used these images as a reference. So we make a series of drawings that show frame by frame, picture by picture, what's going to happen, linking the science and all the director's ideas and what you're going to finally see on screen. But it was scientific papers dating back to 1969, which revealed something very interesting. Those same nurse cells that nurture the red blood cells also seem to fish for and then completely consume the old red blood cells. The nurse cells then reuse the nutrients to create yet more blood cells. It's quite staggering to think that every day inside your body, more red blood cells are born and die than there are people on the planet. But understanding the red blood cells' creation didn't help when it came to animating their journey, which presented some new scientific and technical difficulties. 
that if you go inside an artery to see the red blood cells, there are so many millions of them that you really wouldn't be able to see them individually. So what we did was thin them out so that you could see the individual cells and the blood flow. But even reducing the number of red blood cells viewers could see, there were hundreds that still needed animating. The main red blood cells that you can see flowing out of their arteriole into uh, a vein, these are all hand animated. So all of the ones that you see as solid objects. And then you can see all of these crosses on the other side. Each one of these points has a red blood cell that's associated with it and it loads itself in and makes it into the final image. For the first time on TV, the finished animation showed both the one-mit circuit and the complete life cycle of a red blood cell. The sequence, of course, have its limitations, but we've captured details that I think are a first for an animation about red blood cells. I have a soft spot for the phagocytes. Throughout the series, the white blood cells, known as phagocytes, cropped up again and again. Phagocytes are your white blood cells which patrol the body and eat up dead and dying cells, but most importantly, eat up invading organisms. Creating a plausible animation of one of these bizarre cells wasn't easy. Because it's so amorphous and jelly-like, it has these kind of weird tendrils that kind of go out and act like feelers. It's been a real challenge bringing that to the screen. Scanning electron microscope images of the phagocytes gave the team a good idea of what they look like. And low-resolution black-and-white film showed them how they move, attack and respond. Now, these 3D characters could be storyboarded. The biggest challenge is keeping the scale in mind, keeping track of the different sizes of the different viruses and spores and keeping the feel of the entire thing really organic and fluid has been really important to me so that we can kind of show the animators what textures to put on things. You don't want them to be hard-edged and really solid and mathematical. They're all kind of loose, flowy things. Once the team had created their hero cells, they could place them on the battleground and set them loose to fight the invading viruses. That's a really amazing kind of battle sequence that really shows how complicated and amazing your body is at fighting infections and viruses that, that stray into you. Finally, it was the specially composed music which gave the phagocytes a recognisably ominous presence throughout the series. Luckily, we had these amazing visuals to work to and they were very inspiring. You know, there's the music I've used there is big and brassy and brash. You really have to ramp up the excitement there and you forget all about the fact that it is happening on a microscopic level. It's actually happening at an epic level inside your body. The music really helps the viewer to connect emotionally with what's going on. This series has used science and computers to voyage to worlds that a camera could never reach. It's a long journey, but at the end of it, it's really satisfying to work with such amazing, creative people and to come up with brand new versions of graphics that have never been done before.